Well, today uh, we are in our Avero headquarters here in Knoxville, and uh, we have a special guest. Um, we have in the house Mr. Eric Kimberling from uh, Third Stage Consulting Group, uh, all the way from Colorado, and uh, we are talking about all things ERP, all things digital transformation. Um, uh, as you know, Third Stage does a lot of work across the world um, on digital transformations and uh, specialized ERP consulting. And we have been talking for a while about the uh, similarities and the differences between our uh, client bases and mm -hmm. just want to dig into that a little bit today. So thank yeah. you for doing this. Welcome yeah. to Knoxville. Yeah, thanks for having us. That's great. So talking about um, digital transformations in, in the private sector, I think that there is a lot more speed in terms of how quickly things move. Mm -hmm. uh, in our world, uh, when we go into digital transformations, they're, they're, they're very far behind. Like there are some clients that are still using AS400s and green screens and they don't have virtualized servers. And we have to really show them what's out there in the world. Uh, the good news is they can leapfrog some of the older um, technologies that haven't worked in the last 10 years. Uh, that's the advantage of being in the uh, public sector. Uh, but how do you see it on your end? Yeah, so in the private sector, I think you're right. It does yeah. tend to move a bit faster. Mm -hmm. I think they're maybe a little bit further ahead than, than the public sector. Um, but I think a lot of the challenges you face are going to be similar. I mean, you're going to have uh, change management issues, you know, for example, in people resistance, which maybe it is a little bit greater in government because mm -hmm. you have yeah. more tenure and it's typically more established processes that are harder to change. Mm -hmm. And if the technology is older, you know, it's a, it's a bigger jump for people. Yeah. But still, it's the it's change management and the human side is still important and process improvement and actually uh, getting business value out of the technology and, and uh, getting that positive ROI. Those are all challenges, I think, that are pretty universal across both private and public sector, I think. Yeah, and ROI is an, an interesting one for the public sector because, you know, our clients care about money. It's right. taxpayer money. Uh, but to put an ROI is difficult because their their income comes from taxes. Tax papers, yeah. uh, so there is no profit motive. And that's also led to the point where they don't necessarily keep up with technology. So when we go in there, they're 20, 30 years behind. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's easier to make recommendations on how they should change because it's drastic. Uh, do you ever find yourself in a spot where a client calls you in and you're doing a recommended IT strategy and, and they are pretty cutting edge? How do you guys handle that? As far as if their legacy situation is fairly cutting edge? Yeah, or or they, they don't have anything to improve on. Well, I think it's, you know, technology is changing so quickly yeah. that even if that's true, which it's pretty rare, honestly, that mm -hmm. we come across a situation where a private sector organization is super, super mature and there's not a whole lot of room for improvement because mm -hmm. most organizations just aren't keeping up with technology. I mean, I see technology moving at a really fast pace and organizations are moving pretty slow, like just in terms of their ability to right. change. And I think that's just gonna accelerate in the future because I think technology is gonna exponentially increase and improve and it's gonna become way more sophisticated than any one organization or team or set of humans are gonna be able to handle. So I think there's just always gonna be a gap that you're trying to close, mm -hmm. you know, no matter how sophisticated or mature you are True. as an organization. True. And you use the term maturity quite a bit. Do you guys use uh, CMM or what's your model for, or do you have your own? Yeah, it's a, it's a variation of CMM in terms of just assessing and understanding the, the maturity of their physical systems and mm -hmm. physical infrastructure, as well as their IT organization and just their, their business processes in general. Um, and that's a good way to understand, you know, how big of a change are we talking here? Are we, is it this big or is it mm -hmm. more incremental? Um, usually it's a bigger change than the organization realizes, but some, you know, you, I'm sure you see this too, different clients have different um, objectives they're trying to accomplish and there's there's uh, different, differing and varying degrees of change that they're gonna go through along the way. And then when you have a digital transformation project, do you typically then find that the ERP tends to be the biggest, like the longest pole in the tent? Oftentimes, yeah. yeah. But, it, but we try to, similar to you guys, you know, you're not being affiliated with a software vendor. We don't really care if it's ERP or not. I mean, a lot of times organizations come to us and say, we need a new ERP system. And then you, the first question you ask is, well, why? What, what are you trying to do? Yeah. And, and sometimes you peel back the onion and you find out, well, you, you don't really need an ERP system necessarily. You need to fix your broken processes. You need to mm -hmm. um, restructure your organization potentially to be more effective. And yes, technology is somehow going to fit into that. And maybe it's ERP, but maybe it's not. There's so many 
alternatives to ERP now that I think uh, organizations should just be more open-minded, I think, because best of breed isn't a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe a core single ERP system is the right answer. And maybe it's yeah. not, just depends. I think in, in our in our sphere, we're seeing that that's heading that way too. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, best of breed solutions that do one thing really well, but you have the legacy providers that are like, we can do everything for any region. Yeah. And that's proven to be not true. For a client that has never done uh, a large scale digital transformation or an ERP replacement project, the questions often, who are you? You don't, you don't program, you don't sell the software, you're not a system integrator, where do you fit in? Is a question we often have to explain ourselves on. Um, is it the same case in the private sector? Absolutely. Yeah. You get situations where client wants a, they want a technology and they, they've sort of put their blinders on mm -hmm. unknowingly that they want technology and they want someone that specializes in that one technology. Even if they're, um, oftentimes, even if they're in the evaluation phase of a project and trying to decide on the technology, they'll reach out to software vendors and or system integrators who are yeah. biased and are gonna sell you, they're not necessarily gonna give you the full realistic picture. Um, but then once they get into implementation too, you know, a lot of times organizations um, don't see, you know, why do I need anyone but the software vendor? And mm -hmm. that's a big risk because what happens is it, you've out, you can't outsource these projects entirely. Right. And you also can't just focus on the technology. You need to address the, the human component, the change management, uh, the process design and process improvement, uh, architecture and integration between systems, and then that overarching PMO too, and, mm -hmm. and establishing that program management um, within the organization so that you're not overly dependent on the, the software vendor, the system integrators. But once you look at the whole picture and the client understands the whole picture, they realize, okay, our software vendor is gonna help us with this piece of it, but there's all this other stuff right. that we need to have done that the software vendor is not telling us about, and we don't have the internal capabilities to do, but that's where companies like yours or ours could, can help. Yeah, and that's a that's a commonality between the public and the private sector. Yeah. They all have day jobs. Right. Uh, they're accountants, they're CFOs, they're CIOs, they're accounts payable clerks. And when you pull them into an implementation project where the vendors in our, at least in my experience, they come in and you'll have a one week session on let's say purchasing. Um, and the purchasing agent or purchasing clerk is supposed to sit in and make critical decisions on how they want your future process to flow. And if you haven't done any of the thinking around it, uh, you're dead in the water because now you're gonna have to take the vanilla approach that the vendor's proposing Right. or you haven't really thought this through and when you go live, uh, that's when you find out this is a broken process and you, yeah. it's really hard to go back and do it again. Absolutely, and I, and I think the challenge with these projects, and I'd be curious to hear if you think it's true in public sector as well, but in the private sector, organizations and, and we as humans tend to gravitate to the things we wanna hear. Mm -hmm. Like you, you hear that concept of best practices and oh, you have a pre-configured solution for our industry then I guess I don't need to worry about business right. processes, right? Or I guess those must be the best business processes I could possibly deploy in my organization. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, there's there can't be any such thing as best practice because first, who decides what best practices are? Right. Secondly, if every organization functions the same, then they, they aren't really best practices. They're not making right. you any better than other right. organizations. So, but still as humans, we hear the concept and we think that sounds good. That sounds almost too good to be true and I like it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is sometimes you shouldn't like it because it's not always gonna work. Right, and and there's always the bias, right? You've, you've been to a conference, you've looked at a system, it's a great salesperson, lots of good uh, uh, tchotchkes you picked up at the booth. Right. And as humans, again, we tend to want to do business with people we like and right. are friends with. So there's also that bias. So to cut through all of that noise, I think it's really important for all of our clients to take a good hard look at what business practices are they trying to improve and what the outcome needs to be and forget about the technology because any system out there can do all of these things. Right, yeah, absolutely. So there's a number that's always thrown out there, right? 80% of ERP projects fail. No one's ever come up with the explanation to that. It's like right. discussion we had last night. How, do you, how did you come up with that number? No one knows what that number is or where it came from, but it feels like 80% of projects fail when it yeah. comes to ERP. And in my experience, it, it's mostly because we haven't done the thinking through um, or the building of the use case for why we need a new ERP system or why we need to modernize or change things. It's like building a house. When you go to a contractor, you don't say how much for a house. Right. That's what our clients are doing. Right. They're going to a software vendor and saying, how much for your system, send us a bid and we'll 
push it through and contract with you without having built the architectural drawings or the processes and requirements that, that really need to go into not just the selection, but also as a contract compliance tool. Because right. if, if the vendor has lied to you about their capabilities, you need to have a way to go back and say, hey, look, you said so-and-so in your proposal, you said yes to all these requirements, and now you're saying you can't do that. We've successfully used those um, as contract compliance tools in the past, uh, yeah. but what's your experience? Well, I agree with everything yeah. you just said, first of all. I mean, I think that I take your analogy one step further and say, not only would you not just reach out to the contractor to get a cost on a house, but you also wouldn't reach out to say the plumber mm -hmm. and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Plumber, I want a house with running water. Mm -hmm. So how much is it gonna cost to get the house? And that's what we end up doing a lot of times as organizations. Mm -hmm. We reach out to the plumbers, which are the software vendors, the system integrators, and we expect the plumbers to build us a house that has running water. And so that's the really the key there is, is to recognize that you're not building, you're not plumbing, that's mm -hmm. part of a project, but you're, you're building a house and there's a whole foundation. And like you said, the blueprint and the vision of who you wanna be when you grow up, all that stuff has to be defined up front and software vendors will counter that and yeah. say, no, 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 you don't have to do that. Just use our software and that's gonna um, tell you how to run the business. And that's dangerous because first of all, they don't know your business. Mm -hmm. Second of all, their software is not always going to be the best for what you need, and you're going to have to make changes or perhaps use a third-party add-on or whatever the case may be. And you want to know that you have that vision that directs those sorts of decisions. Right. So totally agree with what you said. Though. Well, and also the definition of failure, yeah. right? It's closely tied to the definition of going live with the software. Right. The vendor will tell you, you can go live in six months. That's the, that's the, you know, the common number being thrown out. Right. In six months, you'll go live, and the clients are wow, I can't believe you can do this in six months. Let's sign. Right. But the definition of going live needs to be uh, agreed upon, right? To the vendor, it's we've deployed your system, you, your name's on it, and sign here and you're live. Right. But to a client, it needs to be, can I run uh, checks? Can I run my HRIS? Can I um, uh, track my inventory? It's right. very, a lot deeper than this, just saying you're now live on a certain platform. Right, and and one step further is is not only can I run payroll, can I can I run my business processes, but am I doing it better than I was before right. Right. I implemented exactly. the software? And that's the tricky part, or that's where vendors don't have a lot of accountability. Mm -hmm. Is they're saying we gave you new technology, but they don't necessarily care, or nor are they compensated for ensuring that they've improved your business or your organization. So I think that's the a big important point, though, is how do you define success and right. how do you define failure? I think that's why that number you mentioned, the eighty percent is so uncertain yeah. or, you know, so uh, qualitative in yeah. some ways because it's it just depends on how you define success. Mm -hmm. If your success, definition of success, yeah, we went live, then I'd say 80% probably succeed because mm -hmm. most of them do go live. Yeah. It's just, what does it look like? Yeah, whose definition is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and going back to the to the why projects fail also, it, it it's difficult to label why things happen, right? Uh, if yeah. you ask a client that's struggling through an implementation that's going on for many years, uh, the common thing to say, well, we haven't been trained. I don't know how to use this thing. Right. Uh, and especially if a project has gone on for two plus years, you, you've forgotten what you did in year one. Right. And you can't just flip the switch and start using a new system because it's also very risky. In our case, it's, um, it's you know, people's taxes not uh, getting recorded correctly or, um, you know, missing inventory from utility systems. It's things that are not quite high impact like your manufacturing client might have, but it's still not letting our government clients fulfill their mission. So right. it's very strategic and high high impact in, in either way. Absolutely, yeah, and, it, and you wanna make sure that you're not, not only are you not undermining your vision and your mission as an organization, but ultimately you wanna be advancing it and furthering mm -hmm. it. And I think so many organizations have set the bar low of for digital transformation just to say, our goal is to not screw this up mm -hmm. and to not fail. Yeah. Well, that's a lot different than, you know, that bar is a lot different than we actually want to make the organization better and more efficient yeah. to provide better service to our customers, our stakeholders, our, our constituents. Right. All that stuff is, you know, in my opinion, how organizations should be defining success. So in your clientele in the private sector, is is it what's the motivation? Is it mostly to become better or is it that something's critically failing and we need to find a replacement? Well, it's, that's a great question. I think I'd be curious to hear what your view of the public sector is because in the private sector, what we're seeing is that in the past, up until say maybe five years ago, 
uh, the, the focus was on let's make our business better. Let's mm-hmm. let's strategically deploy technology. We organizations were never really good at it. They were still failing at a very high rate, but they at least had the, the right intentions and, mm-hmm. and there was a right driver behind the why they're doing this. Now what's happening in the industry, which I think is very unhealthy and risky, and I think that's why we'll mm-hmm. see increasing failures in the near future, is because now you have software vendors who are either acquiring other companies and or uh, decommissioning their old on-premise systems and, and essentially forcing customers into cloud migrations. Mm-hmm. And I'm not here to debate whether or not cloud's right or wrong or whether you should or shouldn't be in the cloud, although we could have a whole separate uh, conversation yeah. about that. But the point is, is it's the wrong reason. Now now organizations are going in with the wrong reason for a transformation it's because they have to. Yeah. And to me, that's the worst reason to do it, even though it's necessary. If you have to do it, you have to do it. Yeah. But if that's your sole reason and you haven't built on top of that what you want to look like at the other end of it, then that's a really dangerous spot to be in. Well, especially if it's driven by by a vendor that right. that's, has an artificial deadline on when they might sunset your existing product. Right. And we have clients that are being backed into a corner mm-hmm. um, because, again, vendors are saying, we just bought this other product and it's nothing but a sticker change. We're going to transition you over to the new system. Um, and sign here, and then when kickoff comes around uh, for implementation, the whole methodology is for a new implementation that uh, our clients didn't sign up for. Right. All because you, I don't want to say fell for it, because there, it is a real deadline. They will pull the plug in and kill the old product. Right. But the way that they're going about putting our clients in a in a corner is not acceptable. I totally agree. And they're, yeah. what they're doing is they're putting their financial and business interests first, which yeah. We all do it, right? We're all, yep. you and I are business owners mm-hmm. too. We have to make decisions that are best for our organization. But software vendors are doing this at such a scale that's affecting hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of organizations throughout the world. And in many cases, in most cases, I'd argue, they're putting those organizations at risk because they're pursuing their own self-interest. And that's a that's a problem. I don't know how you fix it. Um, we're all out watching out for ourselves. So yeah. we're not gonna change human behavior, but it's a pretty, it's a really unhealthy, risky spot to be in, in my opinion. It really is, and I think that that's where our value comes in. Is is we really are advocates for the client. Like one of our core values is caring deeply and passionately for our clients' well-being, not just the projects. Right. And it it, it bothers me when the vendor is nowhere close to having that kind of value. Right. Um, and I think that's what what our clients need, and sounds like uh, yours too. Too. Yeah, our companies are very similar in that yeah. purpose and vision and mission that we're trying to accomplish. So change management in in government. Like you mentioned, it's, it's a it's a bigger concern because of how infrequently they change. Right. And then when you do a large transformation project or an ERP implementation, that's the biggest change, probably once in their career type of change, um, and they're very resistant to it. What we found best is to involve end users from the beginning. Of course, there's formal change management techniques and methodologies, and we do that too. Uh, and I'm curious about what your techniques are, but what we found most effective is just bringing them along for the ride from the beginning. It can't be a project that's coming down from the mayor's office or the city manager's office. Uh, it, it needs to be sold as a project that's gonna, if you're about to leave and retire in two years, the, the, the common feedback is, why are you doing it now? Can you not wait right. for two years? But the way we sell it is, if you're leaving in two years, how what a, what a great way to leave a legacy. Or if you're brand new and just walked into this organization, what a great way to start off uh, by by cementing your legacy and, and setting things up for, for the way you want it. Because they don't, once you're in the government, it, it's rare that people leave for a while. Mm. It's just that kind of industry. Uh, what kind of methodologies do you guys use for change management? Well, I think the first thing, getting back to your first point, is to make sure that the organization recognizes that change is going to be difficult. I, I think, just from my limited knowledge of government, that based, and based on what you just said, mm-hmm. people recognize in government that we don't do this often. We yeah. haven't changed our system in 30 years or whatever the case may be. Um, but in private sector, where they maybe they change a little bit more, they're still slower than you might think to, to change. But even where they do change more often, what happens is there's a false sense of confidence that this isn't going to be that hard for our people because they're complaining about this old system. They want a new system. They're telling us they want a new system. So change management shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. And so just getting people to recognize, you know, without totally demoralizing them, like helping them understand this is going to be difficult. It's not mm-hmm. going to be easy. And here's what's going to happen. And here's when you're going to um, feel the pain of change management if you don't deal with it now. 
And so what we'll do is we'll do organizational assessments early on to say, okay, based on your culture and who you are as an organization, here's where we see the risk and here's where we think people are going to resist. And just to give you a good example, um, a lot of organizations we work with or a subset of them are growing through heroism or heroics. Mm. You know, it's because you've got some really good people that despite the bad systems have found a way to get their jobs done. On the surface, that's great, right? But when it comes to change, those people are really hard to change because now you're threatening their value to the organization yeah. because now I can't be a hero because now you're going to automate part of my job. You're going to centralize the data. Other people can do my job now. You don't, you're not as dependent on me as a hero. And even if I have good intentions, I'm still human and I feel mm -hmm. threatened by that. So it's anticipating those sorts of resistance to change that aren't usually nefarious. I think people yeah. think that change management or resistance to change needs to come from a negative place. It's usually coming from a positive place. It's just recognizing that what what human behavior is going to happen most likely if you don't deal with that up front. And one of the good ways to do that is what you said, which is yeah. involve them early on. But then even then, when you start redefining what their job looks like and you start saying, hey, AV, we're going to take away that spreadsheet that you've been hoarding for mm -hmm. the last 20 years to do your job. We're going to bring that into our central system. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you're probably going to feel a little bit like, wait a minute, I yeah. created that spreadsheet. Yeah. I, you need me for that. And now you don't. Mm -hmm. And it's human nature, again, that uh, what does that mean to my job? Am I going to have a job? In the private sector, they probably worry a little bit more yeah. about, are you going to eliminate my job? Yeah. Maybe a little bit in the public sector, too. But either way, whatever it is, there's, there's usually fear behind that. Yeah. Well, it's it's. I'm sure you feel this way, too. When we go into a client for the first time, it's like office space. Right. Or the bobs. What do you say you do here? You're right. a people person. Right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it it's very common for even if they know that they won't be eliminated, that function will change and they will be reassigned somewhere else. And all of a sudden, again, human tendencies. Been doing this for twenty plus years, day in and day out. Now I have to learn something else um, and do my job differently. Um, and when there isn't a personal uh, in sentiment there, it's really hard to make it their project. And in many ways, and it just proves that these these projects are not IT projects. They are mm -hmm. mislabeled and, they and are. mishandled uh, because they are assigned to uh, at the IT organization. In, in my in our case, that does not understand business. That don't get the nuances of finances or government accounting, mm -hmm. and yet it's the IT department running large-scale software replacement just because it says software. But a majority of the work is business processes, is change management, is people management, uh, and very little is is technology anymore. Again, a lot of these systems do the same things, and IT's job, at least in our project, is is has become limited to making sure that the access to that system, if it's in the cloud or on-premise, is, is secure, that you have the right backups and, and generally people have the right kind of um, access to the system. Other than that, it's not an IT project. Right, I totally agree, yeah. And what you just described is the way projects should be, but what ends up happening and something you and I have talked about before is that you get organizations that don't do the planning and don't do the blueprinting to build the house, mm -hmm. to use that metaphor. And what ends up happening is you get into the implementation and you realize, wait, I haven't spent the time to define my business processes. Right. I haven't addressed change management. And then all of a sudden you've got all this noise you've got to deal with. You're putting out fires and you're in reactive mode during an implementation. So you, quite frankly, a lot of organizations just don't have time now. Now I'm putting out fires. I don't have time yeah. to do all this stuff that I should have done yeah. from the beginning. Now I'm trying to solve a problem. And so, it, and that gets off track. And once you get into that mode, it's really hard to course correct. You can't mm -hmm. just increment a course correct. A lot of times you've got to reset and say, Hey, time out. Let's just recast this entire thing because this is not working. We're, we're going to, keep going down this path that's taking us off a cliff. Let's go, you know, kind of rethink our, our path here. Yeah. And so uh, the way clients engage you it is different from the way they engage us, meaning the sales cycle is different. We have to go through an RFP process or find a contract right. that works. Um, so we have a lot of time built into the sales process where we can actually uh, educate our clients on, on how to go about doing an ERP replacement or digital transformation. Do you see similar things or meaning when, when you are contacted by a prospect and they say, we want to transform digitally or, or put in a specific ERP system and we don't have time for process redesign or thinking through our blueprints, how do you tackle that? It's a great question. It's a tough one because there's a mix. So I'd say most clients that reach out to us, they 
they sort of know how we think. I mean, mm-hmm. they've watched the videos or read blogs or right. whatever. They've, they've somehow gotten to know our philosophy. And in those cases, they it, it resonates with them. And that's the reason they're reaching out to us to talk is because, hey, you know, we agree with what you say or the way you think. And we want someone who's agnostic and who's going to look at the whole picture and all that stuff. But then you have a subset of them, too, that um, maybe they've seen some of the videos or content, but maybe they don't agree. And they, they think the way you just described, mm-hmm. which is this is a technology initiative. I just need to do a quick lift and shift, put a new sticker on it and call it good. And yes, you have to educate, but those are really hard. I mean, it, you, unless you've been through it, which is why clients hire us as consultants, but at the same time you want, we, we like the clients that have some experience and gotten burned in the past, yeah. because if, even if it's in a different life in a past job or whatever, and you have someone internally on the team that really knows how these projects works or have been through it, Unless you've been through it, it's hard to, we can say it, you and I could put some PowerPoints together and yeah. provide a bunch of data and stats and best practices and all of our lessons from years and years of experience. But it's not the same as if I stub my toe and yeah. screw up a project yeah. and I did it before and I don't want to do it again. So it's really hard. And so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll try to put um, those types of clients in touch with our clients that have been through the process or are in the middle of going through the process just to be more of a peer sounding mm-hmm. board. And sometimes that will resonate more than you know, as fancy consultants come in and try and tell them what the right answer is. Yeah. So a question that maybe you and I can discuss too, maybe is why why we started our companies. I think, you know, we're very, we look at our companies, technically we're competitors, which mm-hmm. makes me wonder, why are we doing this video yeah. together? Why are we collaborating? <laughs> we're competitors. We should we should be at each other's throats. I know. <laughs> you suck. You're right. Yeah. You're terrible. You are the worst <laughs> consultant that I have ever encountered in my life. <laughs> no, totally kidding. <laughs> no, but... It, uh, <laughs> But you look at the uh, you you look at the uh, vision or the purpose that we both have as organizations. I think that's something that's very common and very similar in our, in our organizations. And you know the reason I don't know about you, I'd be curious to hear your story. But the reason I started Third Stage was not only because all I know is consulting; it's all I've ever done is digital transformation type consulting and ERP stuff. Uh, but also because what I found is early on, I became jaded pretty early on. Mm-hmm. Or I felt jaded early in my career, in that a lot of the problems you and I have talked about with uh, some of the questionable ethics and conflicting self-interest in the industry, it really creates problems. And, it, and it's putting organizations and their people at risk when software vendors and system integrators come in with their sort of canned one-size-fits-all approaches and their quest to sell more software to organizations. And the reason I want to start third stage was to be that independent, trusted advisor that you could go to and say, I don't want you to sell me software. I want you to help me through this transformation, whatever that looks like, whatever the technology is. And it's strange, even now, I feel like that it's so rare because you think it's so needed, but it's just not the way the industry is built. The industry is built to be wired toward the software. Right. What's what's been your experience? Uh, Why did you start Avero? Very similar. Uh, It's all I know, but also all I know because I focus my career on it. I'm really passionate about finding the the intersection of of academic thinking and Mm -hmm. my training in finance and accounting and, and my bent tours making things better with technology. And this is the perfect thing. I really enjoy it. But also, as I've been, uh, as I've spent years in the industry, I've, I've, I've seen what you've seen. Clients, well-meaning people that have chosen public, in my case, uh, serving the public as their choice of career, are being taken advantage of by software vendors, by especially, and, and all kinds of other vendors. So there is no place for them to turn to ask the right questions. Because right. if I ask you a question, if you're trying to sell me a piece of hardware, that's going to be the answer. So there is a there is a need, a deep need for uh, our services in the public sector and sounds like in the private sector where you can become a trusted advisor, not just on technology, but just business transformation and making things more efficient, especially in government. That's the that's the goal. You're, you're there to provide services to your citizens and, and those are your customers. And our goal is to enable our clients to do that better um, or do that more efficiently, do that faster um, using less less of the taxpayer resources. So, uh, and then communities that we live in and also serve uh, as clients, that, that becomes a, a little bit of a more selfish motive. So right. all of that, not just me, um, everybody at Avero uh, feels deeply about, about these, these values and, and outcomes we're chasing. And that's what makes this even more exciting. Yeah. And it's fun to have that purpose, mm-hmm. right? You and I talked about this before this, yeah. this video that you know, it's fun to build a culture and to hire people that are working for you and following you because they subscribe to that right. vision and that purpose and that greater calling. And 
you know, in today's day and age, it's hard to just compete on, you know, paying someone more or yeah. offer them better perks. I mean, that only gets you so far, but if you can create that deep connection that, yeah. you know, I think our respective employees have, I think that's important. Absolutely. How do you get started on a uh, digital transformation journey? So a lot of times it's, it's um, incident based, right? Something bad happened, especially in our clients, like there's a, there's been a hack, um, CIO leaves and takes all the knowledge with him or her, and there's a catalyst uh, that's an event that that's prompting them to take action now. COVID was a great example, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Tennessee, the Supreme Court of Tennessee said on a Friday afternoon that Monday morning we're going to go virtual. That meant our uh, county clients that run courtrooms mm -hmm. were scrambling to do these things. And uh, one of our clients was in the process of modernization. So they were equipped to actually jump in and do those things. So in the absence of a uh, an event like that or, or COVID, God forbid, another pandemic. Um, what's the first thing that our respective clients should be doing when they think about digital modernization? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, first of all, you do want to have a burning platform for change, yeah. in which case, to your point, mm -hmm. pandemics and sometimes economic situations or IT failures internally can create that burning platform. But the problem with that, the ones you described, is that it's such a burning platform that you don't have any you don't have anything to jump from. You, know? right. you just want it to be enough of a burning platform to motivate you to do something, but you don't want it to be total chaos and panic, which mm -hmm. is what a lot of organizations have gone through in the last two years. So I think creating that, you know, understanding what the driving purpose is of why we need to do this, and ideally not waiting until something like you know, these catastrophic mm -hmm. events happen. Instead, being a little bit more proactive and strategic and saying, look, if we don't do these things, we're at risk of not being able to navigate the next pandemic or uh, having a, another cyber attack or having a cyber attack in the future. Right. So I think defining the purpose and then ultimately um, just defining a strategy that's aligned with who you are and what you are as an organization, what you're trying to accomplish. So depending on what your strategic goals and objectives are, defining a digital transformation and overall business transformation strategy that's aligned with that is really important. If you take that time up front, then you've got back to the blueprint analogy, you've got somewhat of a blueprint or at least a, a rough sketch of what the transformation is gonna look like. And it mm -hmm. puts you, the organization in charge of the project. So now you have ownership and you're the one driving it. You're not relying on some outside party to just take over the project and run it as an IT project. You right. actually have a, a greater strategic alignment internally. Yeah. What have you found? I mean, what have well, you seen? I think it all starts with the vision. If, in, in our case, the, the trigger event is a new mayor or a new city manager that's taken over a new community that uh, that has their own ideas, has a vision. Um, and a lot of times it's the incumbents too that, that have had a vision, but they never had a partner within the organization to turn to and say, this is my vision, get it done. Or they haven't got it done. So. Uh, we start with that vision. We'll go to the mayor, the city manager, the executive director and say, what is it that you want to get done? Don't tell me about the, the, the technical stuff. Tell me the outcomes you're looking for. And we work backwards from there to give them a modernization plan. And, it, and it, a lot of time it's not just technology, it's, it's change management, it's redesigning organizations, business processes, um, deep dive into process mapping and redesign that then leads to recommendations on technology. So all of that starts with the vision of what services you want to offer to your citizens. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good, it's good. And I think no matter what it is, you just want to make sure you have that overarching purpose because it back to the point we talked about earlier, you don't want to be in a situation where you're doing it because someone forced you to, right. or because some external factor forced you right. to. Because once you do that, then you're you just First of all, you don't have as much time. Mm -hmm. Usually you're under pressure, even more pressure to do this quickly. And if you are if you have to do it quickly, it's usually not gonna be correctly. And so if you can get ahead of that, that's really important. And the way to get ahead of it is to have a purpose that doesn't wait until some catastrophic event forces you there. Right, and the more progressive of our clients, they've got strategic plans that are pretty broad and, and policy-based, but to make those plans happen, they need a tactical, um, plan that's operational, that involves technology, that actually gives them the um, the backup to get to that strategic vision. So mm -hmm. any client that has a strategic vision, uh, you know, that can be broken down into digital transformation steps because it all needs to roll up to how you're going to be better as an organization. Right, absolutely. So speaking about experience, I, I think it's important to uh, tell some stories while we 
you know, profess for our profession and, and try to convince people why this is important. Um, we had a client in, uh, in Arizona that uh, will remain unnamed. And, and they bought a system, they signed a contract with a large ERP vendor in the public sector. And they had seemingly done everything right. They had had process mapping done, they knew what processes they wanted to redesign, they had a requirements definition done. They put an RFP out because your clients mostly don't need to do that. Right. Ours do for a large scale implementation or purchase. They have an RFP out and then the vendors respond to it line by line saying, here are the requirements and it's typically thousands of lines and they say yes or no or customizations. So they did all of that. And when we came into the picture, they hired us for the implementation management. So our job was to project manage, make sure they had the resources that the vendor was doing all the right things as contracted. And first of all, at on the day of the kickoff, the vendor shows up with no project plan. Mm -hmm. And we were on this call expecting a project plan. And, and you and I know without a project plan, you can't necessarily, it's impossible to say why, when we'll go live and how to justify that day. But the vendor said, you'll go live in, in, I don't know, eight months, but we don't have a project plan. So that was sign number one, that things weren't quite what they should be. And then once we figured the whole project plan thing up uh, out, as we started implementing and having workshops with the client, it was clear that the vendor had actually misled the client and lied on their uh, response to the requirements. Um, and it can be difficult to quantify and say exactly where, because it's easy for the vendor to say, hey, your requirements sucked. They're not detailed enough. Uh, therefore, what we said stands and we didn't quite uh, mean it that way. You didn't interpret it right. So a couple of months of doing that back and forth, there was some really critical requirements. The client really wanted the system to do uh, project-based cost accounting for them mm. because they're a uh, an agency that receives uh, federal aid, federal funding, and they're responsible for spreading it out across projects, across member cities and counties. And uh, the vendor flat out said, well, that's not what we can do. Uh, you will have to modify your processes to fit ours, fit our capabilities. And the client was doing this on spreadsheets anyway. And now they were like, well, so we need different spreadsheets so we can do this process around your system. So that client was pretty brave. And they said, you know what? We're not going to put up with that. Avero help us get out of this contract. Um, and again, that meant that we would lose billable hours as we're trying to uh, help them find another vendor that might be able to do this thing. Uh, so it did, took a lot of um, uh, back and forth and trying to prove that the vendor had actually lied on the contract. And we were able to get that um, client out of that mess because can you imagine if they had kept going? Oh, yeah. And most clients do. It's it's what I call foolish um, consistency, right? You've mm -hmm. said yes before, so we have to keep saying yes. And most, most organizations would have bit the bullet and said, you know what, we can live without that functionality. I don't want to go in front of the board again. I don't want to go to my bosses and say we picked the wrong vendor. Uh, so I think the vendors also are counting on the client, not making a stand and, and making tough things happen, but commendable that this client was able to have the fortitude and we were able to help them get out of a messy situation. What are some war stories that are similar? Yeah, well, I think, first of all, I think you're right. It's interesting hearing you tell your story because it's uh, it's it's rare, it's a rarity in the market mm -hmm. that you have this um, alternate point of view and not alternate in, in that it's wrong, but it's just, it's different than what the software vendors are putting out there. And so I think you're right. That last part you said about the software vendors really feed into the fact that you don't know what you're doing because you're an organization mm -hmm. that doesn't do this for a living and you, you just never have done this before. And I, if I can build enough trust to convince you that I'm an expert, I can now convince you to not take a stand against the way I want to implement software within your organization. And so right. I think that's great that, you know, our companies exist to help provide that sort of voice of reason and be a sounding board and to be on the client side saying, hey, wait, hold on. Why are we doing this? And mm -hmm. that's not the only path we can take. We've got a million different ways we could approach this. Let's think about some alternate plans that might make more sense for us as an organization. We had a similar situation. It was a, a, one of our larger clients. It's a large a North American based a steel company, a steel manufacturer. And they were in the middle of a, um, 
a big tier one ERP implementation uh, throughout their most of their organization, mm -hmm. not the entire organization, but most of it was going to be implementing the solution. It's a ERP system. And they were about halfway through the project. And this is a seven year project. It's a massive company, wow. massive project. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, seven years is a realistic time frame for this organization. They're about halfway through and right in the middle of the project, the vendor said, hey, by the way, um, we're going to need to migrate you midstream to the cloud, the newer cloud solution. And so uh, they said, "That's this is actually a repeat client of ours that yeah. we've worked with for years. And so they brought us in to do an assessment. And so we came in and assessed and said, look, there's too many deficiencies with this new cloud solution. You're a complex manufacturing organization. This tier one ERP system can't do the things you need to do. You should actually just stick with the legacy product that you're already implementing. You've already invested all this time and money. You're halfway through. Get that in place. And then you can start to revisit, you know, maybe selectively migrating certain parts of the business to cloud. But the vendor was pushing really hard, to your point. They were pushing hard, like, no, 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 go cloud now. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember in these cases, the sales reps are making higher commissions in many cases. And I know this particular vendor, they pay very high commissions on the cloud solution. And in fact, they've stopped paying commissions on sale with the legacy mm -hmm. product. So if you're a sales rep, of course, you're going to sell yeah. the cloud solution. And I'm going to try to get you to buy as much of it as, as you can, whether or not it's right for your business or not. Um, so we steer them back to the legacy product and they're actually still, they're coming up on the tail end of that implementation. And now they're just now, because the vendor has finally started to advance the uh, functionality in the manufacturing space, they're now starting to pull in some of that cloud capability. The other thing we did in this case too, is to say, look, you're running along at this clip at this run rate to hit the seven year mark, but the system integrator you're working with is overstaffing the project. You don't need this many people. They're staffing it back because the original plan, I think was a five or five and a half year plan. Mm -hmm. And early, early on, you know, we helped them recast it to seven years based on all the complexities and the right. scope and everything. So, but the SI never really adjusted the run rate. And mm -hmm. that's another trick that they'll do is to say, yeah. okay, it doesn't matter if it's uh six months to your point earlier, or if it's three years, we're going to staff it the same, which doesn't make sense. Right. If you do the math there, mm -hmm. why would you pay the same, or why would you pay the same monthly run rate for a three-year project as a six month? So anyway, so we helped them scale back um, some of that spend so that not that they were skimping, but just that they, they were timing it better. They're bringing in the technical resources from the system integrator when they needed it. And so that saved them a lot of money too. So it's, it's one of those uh, lessons, I guess you'd say, or battle stories mm -hmm. that is interesting because they were midstream, they were running into some trouble. It wasn't a failure, I wouldn't say at this point, but there were some significant challenges and headwinds they were facing that we were able to help them through. And back to your point, it's, it's good to be that voice of reason to be able to help clients like that through that process.